Welcome to Global Connections with Robert Siegel, presented by the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. Our monthly leaders forum addresses vital issues facing society and the economy, real estate and medicine, technology and science. My name is Dr. Joshua Plout. I am the executive director of American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, AFRMC, a 501c3 national American charitable organization based in New York City. We at AFRMC represent Israel's premier hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva in Greater Tel Aviv, the leading institution named in honor of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. The hospital is a model of coexistence as it serves 1 million patients annually from all ethnic and religious backgrounds with the same compassionate care. Please support our mission with a donation of any amount. Join our community of friends. Visit American Friends of Rabin Medical Center online, afrmc.org via our website and social media outlets, on Twitter and Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube, and on our Facebook page and discussion group. Our host and moderator for Global Connections is Robert Siegel, former host of All Things Considered on National Public Radio for 31 years. Over the course of an hour each month, Global Connections features guests who Robert Siegel interviews as they explore together important issues in our world. Today's Global Connections topic is how 9-11 changed us. Thank you to our very special guest, Larry Silverstein, Chairman of Silverstein Properties, Alice Greenwald, President and CEO, National September 11th, Memorial and Museum of History, and Evan Osnos, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, staff writer for the New Yorker magazine, and senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And now, Global Connections with Robert Siegel. 20 years ago, in the summer of 2001, the American media, for some reason, were absorbed with the threat supposedly menacing our shores. Shark attacks. Every threatening fin spotted off an American beach prompted some discussion on some cable channel of the dangers posed or not posed to us by sharks. On August 6, 2001, President George W. Bush's daily presidential brief included an item far more ominous than the exaggerated threat of shark attacks. It was titled, Bin Laden determined to strike in US. To most Americans in 2001, that name would have meant little. It was Bin Laden's group that had bombed the US embassies in Kenya and Tanzania on August 7th, 1998. Uh, in the waning days of 1999, a number of planned coordinated at Al Qaeda attacks were thwarted in the US and abroad. They were called the Millennium Plot. And in October of 2000, in the middle of a presidential election campaign, bin Laden's group pulled off an attack on a US warship uh, in the Gulf of Aden off Yemen, the USS Cole. Those were stories that preoccupied counterterrorism officials and journalists who covered them, but not the majority of Americans. On September 11th, 2001, Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda burst from the back pages of American consciousness into blaring inescapable headlines. How much did 9-11 actually change us as a country? What's the legacy of that day? Well, as we approach the 20th anniversary of 9-11, we're going to put those questions to an extraordinary panel. We begin with Alice Greenwald, for whom those questions are at the core of her work. Uh, she is president and CEO of the National September 11th uh, Museum a memorial and museum of history. It's located at the spot we called Ground Zero, the hellish pit that held the remains of the World Trade Center towers after two hijacked airliners had flown into them. 
On 9-11, a plane also flew into the Pentagon, and on a fourth flight that was still a ways from its target, passengers learning of what had happened elsewhere charged the cockpit of their airliner and forced it to crash in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. That plane was believed to be headed for the White House or the Capitol building. On 9-11-2001, Alice Greenwald still worked with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. She'd begun as an expert advisor, and ultimately she was Associate Director of Museum Programs. Alice Greenwald, thanks so much for joining us today in this uh, uh, remembering of 9-11 20 years later. Thank you, Robert. I'm delighted to be here. The September 11th Memorial and Museum tells the story of, of uh, what happened on that day. When you think of its, of its impact on us, how it's changed us, what, if we can say the legacy of it was, what, what do you think of? Well, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is the sense of um, invulnerability that Americans felt for the most part prior to 9-11. Mm -hmm. And we weren't the only ones who saw America as, as the last best place on earth. Um, everywhere else, there were terrorist attacks. Um, even the attacks that you just mentioned on the USS Cole in Aden Harbor and, um, you know, in, in the African embassy bombings um, in East Africa. Um, but the thought of an attack on our shores um, was really not in anyone's consciousness. And um, I've even spoken with people from other countries. I remember speaking with someone in India some years ago who said, you know, when America was attacked, it was like they lost that place of refuge, that sense that there was still one place in the world that would never have to suffer this kind of terrorism. Uh, and uh, of course, overnight, um, we had an acute sense of our own vulnerability. Uh, words entered our vocabulary that had not been in common parlance before, like homeland security. Uh, that was a phrase that came out almost immediately and um, it was new. Uh, you know, um, what's so interesting to me is that, you know, 20 years now, we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and 20 is the span of a generation. And there are young people who have no sense of what the pre-9-11 world was like. So to them, it is the norm to take your shoes off at the airport. It is the norm to open your purse when you go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and have somebody look through it. It's the norm to go through magnetometers as you enter public buildings and even some private corporate buildings. These were things that were not common mm. prior to 9-11. So there is that vulnerability, invulnerability um, dichotomy. But there's also in my mind a positive legacy from 9-11, which we at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum refer to as 9-12, um, which is to say that um, the way we responded as a community here in New York, as a nation, and frankly, as a global community, was um, with an extraordinary amount of active empathy. There was um, you know, shared grief globally. People people were grieving for people they didn't even know. They were grieving for that loss of invulnerability. They were grieving for the tragedy and the tragic loss of others. But there was this coming together after 9-11. People came together. People would literally hug one another, strangers on the street, mm -hmm. uh, just because they looked like they needed a hug. Um, you know, there was uh, an impulse to volunteer, to do whatever one could. Uh, and I, I think of the, the um, diversity of ways people did volunteer and, and move to service to others. You know, there's uh, the story of the, uh, the sculptor from New Orleans who um, knew how to weld. And he brought his welding equipment up to ground zero and said, I'm here, I can help. You know, I work with steel all the time. You had a little girl in Tribeca bringing cookies to the recovery workers after 9-11. There was whatever one felt they could do people tried to do. And that impulse to service really was about being part of something bigger than oneself. It was about hope. Um, it was about a belief in resilience. And I would say faith in the unity of this country. You're speaking in the, you're managed. speaking, Alice, in the past tense. Uh, you're speaking of something. I that am, was. because uh, I feel like 20 years later, that legacy has been um, somewhat forgotten. And we're not living in the spirit of the hope, resilience, and unity that were so um, paramount and palpable 
in the days and weeks and months after 9-11. And when I think about what I want this next generation to know, I want them to know obviously about the historical context of the attacks, what led up to them and their ongoing repercussions. 9-11 is not over. It's not over. Uh, someone said um, not that long ago that where the memorial and museum are located uh, is where the 21st century began at ground zero. How can you live in a century and not understand where it began? You need to understand those facts. But children, young people, people in their 20s starting their careers, they also need to know how we responded and that we have the capacity to meet adversity with compassion yeah. and with resilience. So one, one, one other point, you, I, I, I gave your career a short trip. You've worked in, in museums other than the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. But you, I, I associate you with that institution, which uh, certainly conveys the sense of uniqueness of, of what the Holocaust was, while still saying uh, we have an obligation to talk about what is happening in Wanda or in, in Darfur. So does 9-11 have that, uh, that openness to generalize? It has its unique dimension, but does it also have a, some universal side to it? Well, it does have a universal side, but I would have to say that um, there's a, a big distinction between the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, mm -hmm. and the 9-11 Memorial Museum in New York. The Holocaust Museum is not located where the events happened, yeah. Yeah. which gives it a broader platform, if you will. The 9-11 Memorial Museum is at a site of atrocity and uh, it is a graveyard. You know, uh, some 40% of, uh, of the people who, families of people who died in New York on 9-11 have yet 20 years later to receive any remains of their loved ones. We yeah. are the place they come yeah. to grieve. Um, so I think that that our fundamental responsibility, uh, like any battlefield location, uh, like Gettysburg, mm -hmm. is to tell the story of what happened here. That said, we do do a lot of work in our educational and public programs, looking at the ongoing repercussions of 9-11, looking at other terrorist events. Um, we work with law enforcement and uh, intelligence agencies in the military, helping to train the next generation of public servants um, who are working to keep us safe. Uh, we um, actually, um, and many people aren't aware of this, we provide pro bono consulting services hmm. to other communities facing, um, you know, how do you, how do you memorialize and commemorate yeah. events of mass murder and extreme violence? So we've worked with Orlando and Charleston and um, the Sandy Hook community in Newtown and even Manchester, England, as well as Norway um, and, other, and other sites. And, and the idea being that there is a certain practice of memory. There's a way to approach these very difficult topics in a safe and instructive and appropriately sensitive way. Uh, Alice Greenwald, President and CEO of the National uh, September 11th Memorial uh, and Museum. Thank you, and please stick around because in about 15 minutes, we'll have a Q&A session with the other panelists. Thank you, Thanks so much. Uh, when those hijacked airliners uh, flew into their murderous, uh, flew their murderous mission into the World Trade Center towers, every New Yorker uh, had a story of grief or fear or of anger or of luck. Uh, Larry Silverstein's story of that day uh, is unique. He is the real estate developer who was the leaseholder. He'd just become a few weeks earlier, he'd become the leaseholder, effectively the owner of the towers. And uh, typically at that time, he was a breakfast fixture at the Sky High restaurant, Windows on the World at the top of uh, one of the towers. That morning he wasn't there and he survived the events of 9-11 uh, to redevelop the Trade Center area in Lower Manhattan. Uh, Larry Silverstein, Mr. Silverstein, thank you very much for, for joining us today. It's good to see you. Thank you. And I wonder if you could first uh, explain why you weren't at breakfast uh, at the top of uh, I'll the- I'll be happy to, but first let me commend Alice. Because yep. just listening to her remarks uh, brought back all the memories so superbly, so clearly, um, and with it was just, it just, I found, I mm -hmm. found it transformational just mm -hmm. sitting here and listening. Yeah. So Alice, I bless you. 
<laughs> God bless you for what you've done, for what you've always done, and what you continue to do. But I, I couldn't be more impressed, and therefore I thank you from the bottom of my heart. So, Robert, in terms of in terms of why I wasn't there that morning, uh, life works in such unpredictable ways. Um, I had taken title to the Twin Towers about six weeks before 9-11. And on that morning, as all previous mornings, subsequent to my taking title to the properties, I proceeded to dress to get ready to go down for a breakfast meeting with one of my tenants because meeting these people, meeting the tenants, talking to them, getting to understand them, getting to know their needs and so forth, uh, gave me the ability to determine how to move forward with the re, 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 re gilding, if you mm -hmm. will, uh, of the Twin Towers. Uh, they had begun to look a little aged. They began to look, to, they, need, they need some refurbishment. They need some, some areas of upgrading uh, after after the passage of these years. And, and so uh, talking to these tenants uh, to ascertain uh, their most ardent desires relevant to their premises, I felt was hugely important. So that's where I was headed. And on that particular morning, my wife looked at me and said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to work as usual. She said, you can't go. And I said, why not? because I made a date for you with the dermatologist. So uh, I've been plagued all my life with, with the, the impact of the sun. Mm -hmm. I've got fair skin, light colored hair, and the sun has always done me in. And so religiously, I've had to visit the dermatologist. And I said to her, I said, sweetheart, you're right. I need to go but I'll do it next month. She said, no, you're gonna to have to do it this month because you canceled last month and you canceled the month before. So she said, so you've got to go. And she proceeded to get angry and upset. Now, when you're married to the same woman for 45 years, as I was at that time, and she gets angry and she gets upset, my first reaction was, sweetheart, don't get angry, don't get upset. The words are yes, dear, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. But please don't get upset, please. So she said, okay. <laughs> and then the phone rang. It was my captain. We maintained, a, we had a modi out on the doctor uh, uh, at a little further north on the Hudson River uh, at Chelsea Piers. And he called and he asked my wife, he says, Mr. Silverstein, okay? And she said, yes, why do you ask? He said, turn on your television set. Mm. So we turned on the television set just in time mm. to see a plane coming around. The North Tower was in flames. It was horrendous. It was a horrible thing to watch. But then to a hour, further horror, we watched the plane come around to the South Tower and crash into it from the, from the south heading north. And instantly we realized this was a terrible, terrible catastrophe. And next question was, what's happening to all of our personnel? What's happening? Two of our children work with us in business and they were on their way to the World Trade Center because we had temporary quarters down there on the 90th floor of the North Tower. And so <laughs> uh, the thoughts that went through our minds thereafter, we don't have to discuss. It was a, it was a brutal time. You, you, you did know people who who, who died on 9-11. We knew many, many people. And we lost, we lost four of our employees who had six children among them. And, um, and it was just horrendous. Just, so we set up, we, we set, set up a, a scholarship fund for the kids. Why was it so important to you? This, this had been, I mean, you were already 70 years old when this happened, I should right. say. This was, right. we would think of that as having been the crowning achievement of your, of your career as a, as a developer. Yes. Um, why was it so important to rebuild fast and to rebuild big? Well, there were, it became instantly obvious to us that this was going to be a massive tra tragedy. It was going to affect New York most horrendously. 
And it was hard to begin to even contemplate the specifics because we, no one knew what was going to come later that day, what was going to come tomorrow, what was going to, the next we, day. We didn't know it was over. We didn't know it was we over. We didn't know it was over, correct. So, but what we realized was that these buildings were gone and there were so many other buildings that were affected by it adversely that my, my immediate sense was that people were going to pick up and leave downtown New York because the stench was horrendous. The heat, uh, the, the flames, I mean, every, everything, everything that was happening down there was beyond comprehension in terms of its intensity and its impact on everyone. And so we just visualized a massive uh, vacating of, of Lower Manhattan. Uh, and ultimately, the word that went around was, well, the last one out, please turn off the lights. Uh, because the, 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 the movement out of, for example, out of residences downtown was total. People just couldn't live there. They didn't want to live there. They picked themselves up and moved uptown. And then major firms announced that they were going to relocate uptown. Of course, there was no way to house them down here. The space didn't exist. The facilities weren't there. And so major corporations, like we had 10 million square feet of office space in the Twin Towers. No way to house them, no place to put them. And so they picked themselves up and started leaving yeah. en masse. And so it became obvious to me that unless we did something to stem this exodus, unless we could show people that we were determined to rebuild, then the terrorists would end up winning. They would, they would accomplish their mission. And I, we couldn't let that happen. I, I want to ask you one other thing before we we, uh, we have to move on. But uh, Alice Alice Greenwald mentioned that the, the the days when people would hug each other in the streets of New York. What happened? Uh, I'm I'm speaking now as a New Yorker who's been living out of town for the past 45 years and uh, grew up in Lower Manhattan. Uh, and at uh, by 9/11, I happened to be in New York. But in those days. I would I would drive to and from work past the Pentagon, where I watched the Army, uh, the, the the Defense Department rather, rebuild the Pentagon uh, quite quickly uh, and be done with it. Whereas in New York, every manner of argument, uh, economic, uh, engineering, uh, political, seemed to be brought to bear upon what to do and how to do it. Did, did uh, you guys weren't in a hugging mood as, as you were negotiating what to do with the properties? Was it a dispiriting time to be in such hard-nosed, difficult negotiations, such litigious times, so soon after the, uh, the tragedy that had happened at night? Uh, the answer was, of course, there's no way you could, you could live through that and not realize its impact on everyone. Yeah. Uh, it was a terribly negative time. Uh, but I'll also tell you, at the same time, something that Alice mentioned um, I think was perhaps showing New York's best times. Uh, it's, uh, it showed New York at its very best because people who didn't know who was, who was in prison down there, who was down there, who was still alive, who, who's, who was gone, but who had to be removed, uh, came in droves hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people drove down the West Side Highway. And after a while, New Yorkers just stood there in the mornings as those people, as the rescuers, if you will, uh, drove down and applauded them. It was like, it was like seven o'clock with the, with the COVID and people would come out on the balconies at seven o'clock to applaud, to applaud the, the, the special workers, the hospital workers and so forth, who gave it themselves so selflessly. Uh, these people coming down to help people they never knew, never met, didn't know, have a clue as to who they were and expose themselves to the most horrendous conditions. I mean, that the air, the quality air downtown was terrible. Yeah. Uh, and so, but here they were and it was exquisite. And I'd say that was probably one of New York's most exquisite times. Well, Larry Silverstein, uh, thank you for being with us today and, and stick with us because there'll be a Q and A session in about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, thanks for, for being with us so far. And Mr. Silverstein is uh, uh, the, the developer who was effectively uh, the, the landlord at the World Trade Center Towers back when. 
Uh, our next guest, Evan Osnos, has a book coming out soon about the changes in this country over the past uh, two decades. Uh, he writes about a time framed by 9-11 and January 6th of this year, although it's not a book about 9-11 by any means. Uh, Osnos writes for The New Yorker at the Chicago Tribune. He was part of a team that won a Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. Uh, later, after he became a Beijing correspondent, his book about China, Age of Ambition, uh, won the National Book Award. His forthcoming book is called Wildland, The Making of America's Fury, and it's about the past two decades in three places in America where he has lived, Clarksburg, West Virginia, Chicago, and Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, Evan Osnos, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Robert. It's great to be with you. Uh, you know, I, I was going to ask you, Alice Greenwald alluded to this quotation that you that you cite. It was Tony Judd, uh, the historian who wrote uh, of the experience of 9-11 in New York. Uh, I, uh, from my window in lower Manhattan, I watched the 21st century begin. Mm. Uh, about 20 years later, do, do the events of that day stand up as that kind of powerful, influential landmark moment in American history? Yeah, I think we didn't even know it at the time, just how deep that observation really was. Uh, you know, and I have to say just to, very briefly on a personal note, to Larry Silverstein's description of rebuilding Lower Manhattan and the importance of that, I, as, a, as a member of the New Yorker, our office, of course, is at One World Trade Center. And if you go down on a given day today, it is thriving, it is bustling, and it feels like we are all the beneficiaries of the decisions that were made in that period. Um, so I thank Larry Silverstein for that. Thank you. I, I am also um, very, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about the way that, as Alice Greenwald put it, you know, I was, I was drawn back to that moment, that period of togetherness that we were all inhabiting. I lived in New York City at that point. I was a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, lived on the Upper West Side. And like so many reporters, I spent the next few months um, trying to get my head around what had happened to this country and specifically to the city. And that was for people in, you know, of my age, I'm 44 today, I was 24 then. And in so many ways, the post 9-11 period, Robert, has been the defining fact of my adult life mm -hmm. to a degree that I think I could never have understood at that time. You know, I, I started covering the attacks themselves that eventually led to being posted to the Middle East. I went to Cairo and then eventually on to Iraq. Um, for the Chicago Tribune and then eventually on to China. And I was abroad for a decade and I came back to this country and it's impossible to look at the political culture, which I now write about in Washington today without understanding the beginning of the changes, the things that were happening in those moments. And I you know the metaphor that comes to mind was just as there were things in the air at ground zero that we didn't yet understand. Mm -hmm. There were things in the political air that were beginning to settle into our to the national consciousness, our mental commons, and they changed us in ways that I think we're still contending with today. On 9-11, uh, members of Congress of both parties uh, stood outside and sang, God bless America. Uh, uh, it, it, it wasn't a typical moment then, but it certainly yeah. seems Im impossible today. Yeah, you know, you look at those images from that day and uh, they do feel like something from a time capsule. I, the way I've come to conceptualize some of this period was that we experienced these two national shocks to our psyche, in effect. There was September 11th and there was January 6th. They were the bookends of this period, this extraordinary period that historians will be looking at for a long time to come in which in which as a country we were tested, we were, we were pulled all, and in so many ways, some of the best attributes came out in those first few weeks and months that we saw where we sort of pulled together. And then we saw also these underlying stresses that have become so clear. I was, you know, on the day of 9-11, I was, I happened to be passing through Washington. And so I went and covered the Pentagon that day then came back to New York. And here on January 6th this year, I'm here in Washington and I went down and covered the events at the Capitol on that day. And in a way it is, um, if you step back for a moment, you have to begin to look at these two shocks to our sense of ourselves and the story that we tell ourselves as a country. As Alice put it so well, I thought, you know, that sense of invincibility that was shattered on 9-11, um, it, 
I think it 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 hit us more deeply than we understood at the time. I'll, if you if you'll bear with it, I'll give you one example, Robert. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an interesting one. Um, I worked in this little town called a little city called Clarksburg, West Virginia. I worked at a little newspaper there, the Clarksburg Exponent Telegram. And on the on the day after the attacks, this little newspaper ran an editorial that said. Far be it for a small town newspaper to tell the country how to behave. But what we know about ourselves is that our response to this must be that we will strengthen our core values. We will not depart from them. And those core values are diversity, tolerance of dissent. And there was a very strong spirit in the air. Actually, there was a, at that point, there was an attack on a, on a mosque not too far away in Princeton, West Virginia that, that fall. And people rallied around it. Uh, it had, there'd been graffiti on the mosque. Somebody had written the name Jamal, and and uh, there was a there was a clear sense that people wanted to kind of express their best elements of their community, and they were proud of having done so. And if you fast forward then six or seven years, actually by two thousand eight, you began to see the effects of years of political change. About a fifth of people in West Virginia by two thousand eight believed that Barack Obama was a Muslim. And if you fast forward then another few years, there was another attack on that same mosque in 2013. And at that point, the reaction was much quieter. Yeah. There was not the kind of mass outpouring of support of coming together around that, around that place. And this is by no means a criticism of people there. It, it is a reflection of a national phenomenon. And it caused a lot of soul searching. Yeah. And people began to ask what, what happened in those years. Uh, yeah, I, I would just observe that at, at around 9-11, I recall from uh, President George W. Bush uh, expanding the old line about when Americans worship, as we had come to say, in their churches and synagogues, it was at that moment where we added in their churches, synagogues, and mosques, and uh, America's Muslim population uh, ceased to be invisible, and uh, uh, President Bush actually was concerned about about a backlash against American Muslims. The biggest the biggest consequence, I suppose, of what happened on 9-11 was we went to war. The US went to war in Afghanistan. And then, according to the administration of George W. Bush, it was connected to 9-11, we went to war in Iraq. Uh, it's 20 years later, both of those wars came to be regarded as endless wars. Uh, that That's not a, a liberal or a conservative opinion. That seems to be a universal opinion. They're finally ending. and. Uh, it's been my impression, tell me if you agree, that it's an enormous difference, that the experience of the past 20 years is enormously different in families uh, that had people who deployed and families that didn't have people who deployed in the service. Yeah, it's one of the great, I think, artifacts of this period that is worth describing so clearly because less than one half of 1% of, of the American population ended up serving in these wars. And as we know, many of them returned over and over again, I mean, the, the, the burden on rural places, particularly on small towns in this country was unusually heavy that people had to go back, particularly in the National Guard. I mean, you could follow it on the pages of this, of this newspaper, in fact, in West Virginia, you could see in the very beginning, they were very proud to send people off to war. They covered the departures at the airport. Then they covered when people came home. Um, and over time, you began to hear them say, this is, beginning to exact a toll on us economically and personally. So I think, you know, I am sort of mindful as we get closer to the, to the anniversary, I'm, I'm thinking as much about places in this country that are far away from my own places, Washington, New York City. I'm trying to think as much about how this has really re sort of refracted through the lives of, of other places, because ultimately that has come to shape our politics um, because people were responding to that. And you know, I spent, I was um, in Iraq as a journalist, I was embedded with Marines for the invasion and then was, was in and out of there for the next two years. And when you talk to a lot of the people who served over there as service members, um, there is this feeling that they are part of a, of a brotherhood and a sisterhood, but it is confined. It's not a, it was not a shared national experience. And so they find some kind of solace in that community but it's a very different experience. Had there been a draft, had there been a national war levy that said we are all contributing, I'm not arguing that there should have been a draft, okay. but it changed fundamentally how this shock to our national psyche was experienced compared to um, Pearl Harbor or other moments in which we were 
summoned essentially to recognize our vulnerability and our connectedness. You you uh, uh, you noted in 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 your in your forthcoming book, uh, you note that um, one way in which uh, the wars were uh, covered uh, by mass media, a typical way was the surprise homecoming of the service man or woman who would uh, uh, at, suddenly appear at the ballpark and and uh, meet his children who haven't seen him for a long time. Th there wasn't a very, uh, uh, I, I would say, th there wasn't a very rigorous description of what was going on conveyed to the American public during those wars. No, and I, you know, I put that on, on my shoulders of my profession too. You know, I think we struggled with how to convey the wars. And I, you know, I will tell you at one point, Robert, I, I used to find those kinds of videos of people coming back and, and surprising their kids. I found them kind of thrilling. They were something wonderful. They were always the last bit on the local news broadcast, yeah, yeah. something positive. And, and the more that time passed, and frankly, the more you know, I, I had kids of my own, and I began to look at those videos slightly differently. I would look on the faces of those kids, and there was anguish there. There was, these were kids who were bearing more than their country should have asked them to, their mm -hmm. parents going away and away and away. And that became for me a moment to sort of meditate a bit on how we as a country uh, either did or did not take on the national responsibility of, of bearing the costs and how we will, um, I think hopefully do, a, do it differently next time. One, one more point before we bring back uh, all of you together, all of our panelists, uh, and that is, uh, I, I gave a brief summary of what happened on 9-11. I, I think it stands uh, uh, the scrutiny of reading the 9-11 Commission report, but there did develop very quickly a counter narrative of what had gone on. This was, uh, yeah. it was the Mossad, it was, uh, it was an insurance scam, uh, uh, the so-called truther movement, uh, which seemed extreme and, and uh, at the time, but as, as you've observed, it, it, it presaged a, a an approach to politics that has that has blossomed over the past twenty years. It, it was, you know, I, I in the course of preparing the book, I went back and sort of looked at the roots of this culture of disinformation, which has become so rampant now. You know, on nine eleven, Mark Zuckerberg was was you know, still a young person had not yet even considered <laughs> Facebook. So the apparatus, the tools had not yet been created. But what we saw was the germ of these ideas, this kind of fundamental distrust of received wisdom. You know, when I lived in China, I used to think a lot about a quote from Hannah Arendt in which she says that when people eventually give up on this notion of a, of a received truth, of a shared truth, they begin to question everything and they, begin, they believe nothing. And in the years after 9-11, we saw some of these kind of political opportunists, people like Alex Jones of, of Infowars, who began to describe 9-11 as a, an inside job. This was, a, you know, he was promoting a delusion, marketing essentially a political identity on the basis of it. And in retrospect, I don't think that we understood that this was a five alarm fire. Mm -hmm. You know, these were not cranks who were gonna have no impact on our politics. They were beginning to kind of bleed into the popular discourse and, um, and ultimately, they what we ended up seeing on January 6, 2021, was the sort of outgrowth of this distortion in our political culture uh, that, that began so long ago. Uh, Evan Osnos of The New Yorker, thanks for being with us. And I'd like to, to bring back Alice Greenwald uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Silverstein, Larry Silverstein, all three of you, uh, to put some questions that we were, um, that uh, friends sent us and, and wanted to hear from. And I, so I'd like to begin st starting with them. Um, in the order that, that you spoke earlier, Alice and then and then Larry and then Evan, um, do you in your uh, in your heart of hearts uh, do you do you sort of expect uh, another terrorist attack on the scale of 9/11 or something comparable, or do you think that somehow we've we've uh, we've 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 diminished the possibility or the the likelihood of something like that happening? Uh, Alice, when you when you go through the museum, do you? Can you imagine that or what, what do you actually think? Well, I would certainly prefer not to imagine it. Um, you know, it, it was horrific um, 20 years ago. And um, I will say that we, we really do owe a great deal of um, gratitude to our law enforcement and military and um, intelligence agencies. They have done a remarkable job of keeping the homeland safe um, these past two decades. Uh, but I, I believe we live in a world now of, um, you know, uh, extreme unpredictability, 
Mm -hmm. um, and um, where sadly uh, in the 20 years since 9-11, extreme violence has become more the norm than the exception. Uh, my children did not go to school worried that there would be a shooting in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't used to go to synagogue worried that some you know, person would come in with an AK-47. Um, I didn't go to concerts as a young woman um, in arenas and worry that some horrible event would happen. We live in a world where these now are not only possible, but they are recurrent events. And I think we would be um, foolish not to worry that something could happen again. That said, I think, uh, you know, we have to live our lives and we have to live our lives in a positive manner um, with the expectation that we can rise above the uh, incredible pressures that we are under um, as a nation and as a global community. Uh, Larry Silberstein, what, what, what do you think about the, the possibility of another similar uh, event? I, my thoughts are to the effect that the probabilities I think are very much against it. I certainly hope and pray they're against it, but I can't help but think back to the design criteria that we embraced mm -hmm. when we started to design the replacement buildings, the new buildings at the rebuilt World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. And when I, I, I look at the, the amounts that we paid for the trade center to begin with 3.2 billion and the, the amount of the, the incredible amount that's going into the rebuilding effort. Uh, it's part, it's partly a reflection of the embodiments of enormous, um, enormous um, increase in standards. Um, and so uh, by the time we got finished, uh, the building department, the city of New York, uh, came to the realization that it had to upgrade the standards. <laughs> but <laughs> but could could the build could the one world uh, the, the Freedom Tower where Evan works could that sustain a hit from a, from an airliner? And absolutely, uh, really, all these buildings are yeah. designed um, totally uh, in cognition of the fact that what transpired in 9/11 could never possibly be allowed to happen again. Yeah. And since I knew that my, my family was going to work in the new Seven World Trade Center, which is the last building to come down on 9-11, but the first one to go back up. Uh, I simply determined this building had to be the best building ever built in America. And let me tell you, it is. Uh, but then the other buildings followed suit. So we, we went to extraordinary degree to ensure the fact that it wouldn't happen or yeah. couldn't happen. Okay. And, and as you said earlier, uh, the, the deterrent effect of telling anyone who, because obviously in 1993, terrorists had tried to blow up the World Trade Center with a car, a truck bomb. But by, by rebuilding, you would see that, I assume, as a deterrent to anyone thinking there was any point in, in building, since That's the cool. Americans will not uh, uh, stand by and let that end. Evan, what, what do you think? Do you, do, you, do you go to work wondering, uh, you know, could something like that day happen again? Well, I, I tend to think less in terms of whether something like that itself would happen again. We're pretty good at sort of fortifying ourselves against the, the last war, in effect. What I think a lot about is whether we have the political fitness to make the smart choices, whether we are putting people into positions of responsibility who will tell their bosses, who will tell an elected official, will tell the president, you need to pay attention to this, or this doesn't agree with your ideas, but this is important. You know, in some ways, that's the that's the infrastructure that we don't that we don't put on the ground in concrete form. But in the end, we always end up going back and saying, how did this happen? Whether it was 9/11 or the financial crisis, it's the political infrastructure and whether we have an allegiance to fact and to a tolerance of dissent. You know, the same words that were on the front page of that small town newspaper that, in fact, does create a a strong system that is capable of absorbing the shock that you can't anticipate. Uh, Alice uh, Greenwald, you, you mentioned earlier that for somebody who is uh, a young adult today, uh, and in Evan's case, a, 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 a middle-aged adult. Uh, I'll take it. I'll, my adult... kids won't agree that I'm anything near young, so I'll take it. <laughs> Their adult lives have been marked by uh, 
9-11, a great recession, a terrible recession. And then this strange thing that uh, prompted this series of panels that we do, the, the pandemic. Uh, so I wonder, uh, is there anything in the history of 9-11, uh, uh, starting with you, Alice, do you think that we can help us with the complexities of living in a pandemic-stricken uh, global community? It's a great question, and I would have to say, and I don't want to sound Pollyanna-ish about it, but you know, we reopened the 9-11 memorial um, in July, July 4th of 2020, which was early. The museum could not open yet. It was an interior space and we couldn't open it. But the reason we pushed to open the memorial was this collective sense that our city needed a place, people needed a place to go to be reminded that in the worst moments, you can come back. And as Evan said, you come to the World Trade Center now, thanks to Larry and a whole host of, of people who worked on it. You know, it's a place of vibrancy and vitality and, and commerce and art. And we have a performing arts center under construction and transportation and, and retail and memory at the heart of it. And so you've got the, the possibility, the recognition that things will happen that you may not be able to control. You can control how you respond. And we responded with the determination to rebuild and renew. And that's a message young people, I believe, need to understand that we have that ability to meet adversity and prevail. Even if the adversity is a, is a, a, a novel virus. Larry Silberstein, lessons from 9-11 from, uh, and, and uh, the World Trade Center for the age of COVID? There are so many lessons, but I will tell you, one of the things that affected me very deeply um, was when questions surfaced um, as to why we should be so intent on rebuilding. I think the first thought that came to my mind among several uh, was that um, if we didn't rebuild, we would effectively have let the terrorists win. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, what they, they, these were not just an attack on the Twin Towers. This was an attack on America, attacked on our beliefs, attacked on our country, attacked on our constitution, but, but everything, everything we, we, we've, we've lived with and believed in uh, all of these years. And by golly, one thing we couldn't do was let that happen. So I simply said to myself, and then I said to everybody else following, I said, we're gonna rebuild this place mm -hmm. because as New Yorkers, we just have to show that we will not cower under these circumstances. We have to show our strength. We have to show our determination. And let's get out there and accomplish it and accomplish it a hell of a lot better than it was to begin with. And so and that, so I insisted on that. That was just one aspect of it. It was so many more because we, as you know, we lost almost 3,000 people that day. Mm -hmm. And once we got into serious discussions on what we were going to do and how were we going to use the land. Um, obviously the most important decision was to think about how we're going to honor those people who lost their lives that day. Uh, and, and so the importance of an appropriate Memorial Park and ultimately what resulted was an eight acre Memorial Park. So we started out, we had 16 acres downtown here on the site. Mm -hmm. First determination was made was to take eight of them and use it for memorial purposes, right? So, and then how to configure the rest of the site for 10 million square feet of buildings and so forth, it's similar to what we had originally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and so, of course, I listened to so many people. I mean, one of the recommendations from the then mayor, Rudy Giuliani, uh, was to not use it uh, for any purpose other than a memorial site. It should be like the Gettysburg battlefield. Yes, right. yeah. uh, and I thought about that and I didn't think it made any sense at all because what we had, what we had here was a thriving business community with, with thousands of people involved in every every frame of commerce and industry. So when you thought, when I thought about it and I said, we've got this 
the 11 mass transit lines serving the World Trade Center. How do we not rebuild it and use it as it was, essentially as it was used before? But let's just do a better design job and eliminate some of the things that people, New Yorkers, were not happy with yeah. in the original Twin Towers, right? And so uh, began to think those things through. And then I suddenly, once the government made the decision uh, with respect to the utilization of eight acres for the memorial, the balance of it for the, for the, for the buildings themselves, uh, and what would go where, uh, what was particularly difficult to live with was having to meet with hundreds and hundreds of families, surviving families, who came and asked for an opportunity to talk to me. And I found while I, this was not an area of my control, this is an area really relegated to government. That's just their responsibility. But I felt I couldn't deny the request for meeting. And so they came and they said, you know, our husbands, our loved ones are still down there. Yeah. Uh, they were, uh, they were full, almost the, the intensity of the heat, uh, the intensity of the fire, the flames, uh, their bodies are down there somewhere, but there's no way to find them uh, because in a sense, they were completely destroyed. Uh, so by virtue of there being no remains, we can't have a burial. And if you can't have a burial, you cannot make closure. So they said, therefore, please understand that no place on that site can you use it for purposes other than a memorial. So I listened to them. I said, I said, you know, I didn't lose, thank God, I didn't lose any family. I didn't lose any loved ones. So I can't fully appreciate the depth of your, of, of your loss. I said, but at the end of the day, we have to think as New Yorkers. At the end of the day, we have to do what's good for New York. And they said, you're absolutely right. We must do what's good for New York. But under no circumstances, you build any place on that site. Of course, of course, by saying that, when you said, when you took that position, you being a developer, and in a city, I might have, that has a peculiar culture of the landlord being a, uh, not, not your best friend. Uh, but by saying that, you ran the risk of saying, well, that's Silverstein. Silverstein's in business. Uh, he, he doesn't want to see it turn into a memorial park because he, he, wants to, he wants to get back to making money off of the site. You're saying commerce is important. Commerce is an important value of our, in, in, in making these decisions. Well, actually, when you think about it, we had such a thriving community down here thousands upon thousands of residents picked themselves up and left. And it occurred to me that if this did not get rebuilt, yeah. if this that did not get done as quickly as it needed to get done, and as well as it needed to get done, right? Vastly superior to what had been there before. We had to complete, totally improve what had existed prior to that. Then the lowest, the lower part of the city would never be the yeah. same yeah. again. And that to me, I, I just, I, that was yeah. difficult for me to accept. Well, let, let me let me turn here as we're, we're going to wrap up our discussion shortly to Evan Osnos. Uh, you work you work in that area. You work in, in, in Freedom Tower for the New Yorker. Um, have you gotten accustomed to this to this memorial? Is, has, it, has it turned into an equestrian statue of a Civil War general yet uh, to you? Mm -hmm. something, something that's just there and you know it's there without thinking about the story behind it? Or is it uh, is it packed with meaning for you? Well, you know, I I'm based in Washington, so I yes, go to the right. home office, but I, I go up, you know, fairly frequently. And in some ways, I think the combination of the memorial and the building itself, in some ways, you know, Robert, I'm struck as we're talking about it that these are elements that we would be that we would want the people who are too young to have experienced 9/11 to take from it. As an example, resilience, the fact that that area is now what it is again. Mm -hmm. is a measure of America's determination to rebuild itself. And at the same time, the memorial is a, and the museum is a, is a determination to remember, not to paper over our history, even when it is painful, and to acknowledge it and to say, this is who we are. 
And a third piece of it, which you mentioned earlier, is the 9-11 Commission Report, which is in its own way a deeply American document. It is this act of sort of public assessment of ourselves, this reckoning with what happened. And you can't understand that event and the legacy of that event without all three of those pieces. And they begin to, I think, give you a sense of what the American meaning of, of 9-11 is now 20 years later. Well, uh, Evan Osnos of The New Yorker, Larry Silverstein, uh, and Alice Greenwald, uh, thank, thanks to all three of you uh, for taking part in this, in this discussion as we, uh, we're, we're approaching the 20th anniversary of, of 9-11. Uh, for the last few minutes, by the way, of today's Global Connections, we're going to return to our roots. Uh, Dr. Michael Drescher is head of the emergency department at Rabin Medical Center in Pedach Tikva in, in Israel. Uh, his appearances here have always been uh, smart and informative, but I have to uh, confess, Mike, uh, that I, I was looking forward to our not talking uh, uh, this way anymore, because I was looking forward to COVID being behind us. Uh, that's obviously not the case. Uh, and uh, I'd like you to talk with us a bit about uh, COVID in Israel. Uh, are you with us? Uh, yes, uh, I, Robert. W wonderful discussion with you and your and your uh, distinguished guests. Um, really brings back uh, the memory of 9/11 and the 20 years since. And here we are with uh, this very dissimilar, but uh, likewise uh, kind of life uh, yeah. altering crisis. And we did think, as you said, that uh, perhaps we had been over the hump. Perhaps the wave was behind us, and certainly um, we're not. Um, maybe we're in a different, maybe a less, maybe this is a, a beginning of some kind of an end that we can see, but uh, certainly we're not where we thought we were uh, three or four months ago. Uh, just to give us one example, you've already had a booster shot. Correct. Yeah. Yesterday, I'm 60 years old, and uh, everybody over 60 in Israel is encouraged and eligible to get a booster shot. So, of course, I did. You you got your your uh, vaccines back in in December January. Does that mean that we should expect eight months later the the power of the uh, of, of of the vaccine to be wearing off and 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 you need the booster or is it just uh, an excess of caution? Well, I don't think it's an excess of caution. I think it's a reasonable caution. We don't know with any certainty that the booster has worn off. We know that it's less effective than the Delta virus. That may be more of the issue now where people getting um, getting uh, uh, sick who or getting the infection who have been vaccinated. Uh, but we don't know for sure that if there's any real decrease in the activity. However, we do know that the likelihood of anything bad happening from a vaccine is very, very small. And so on balance, it was felt here that yes, let's go ahead initially with older people, more at risk people, uh, also sicker people to get a booster shot. It may be that it's, um, a little bit superfluous, but it also may be life-saving. And so given the no no downside or very small downside, I was thought, let's go ahead and do it. What percent of Israelis now have, have been vaccinated? Well, we're, we have about a million people who still haven't been vaccinated. That includes children. Mm -hmm. uh, so little children are not going to be vaccinated, at least in the near future. When you get to people who are over 60 and 70, we're over 80 to 90%. And of the booster shot we had, and which was just initiated a week ago, uh, 600,000 people have had the booster you know, in a population, uh, in an over 60 population of about um, a million or a little bit more. So, so we've made good progress on the, on the vaccination front and um, hopefully that's gonna stand us in good stead and hopefully everybody else you know, across the world will also get. Uh, I've heard American experts uh, in, in, as, as they were taking on board the, uh, the potency of the, uh, the Delta variant, uh, they would they would speak of Israeli information as being very important uh, to understanding and and Israeli tracing as being very good. What what is it that you're doing there in Israel that gives uh, health authorities a, a a clearer picture of of what the COVID story is? Well, Israel is a compact country, uh, very uh, advanced kind of technologically. We don't we don't have a lot of medicine in terms of money spent, but the uh, but we do have a lot of medicine in terms of in terms of quality and in terms of organization of primary care. So everybody belongs to a health fund or a HMO type of an organization, and they're all well enough organized that they can get information back. They can both roll out a program such as we, such as the vaccination program in a very efficient way, and they can get information back uh, to be analyzed. And so that's really been, that was one of the reasons why the Israelis got the first, uh, first wave of Pfizer so quickly was because they were able to pr promise 
we'll get back to you with with good information on this vaccine. And they did. And, and indeed so, we did. so in that deal, there was something in it for Israel to get vaccinated quickly, but something in it for Pfizer that if, if the Israelis did it, Correct. they would they would be able to to measure the success of the of the vaccine right away. And if it had worked out that way, not that the lack of success. Uh, well, I hope things improve. Uh, I hope things are uh, looking up both on your end uh, and, and ours when it comes to COVID. Yes, well, we're going to hope that the, the Delta virus, well, it's very infectious, is perhaps a little bit less dangerous. Maybe, maybe the fact that it's, you know, viruses want to survive. They want to get from one to another person and they don't want to kill you. They want you to live along with it. And so if that's the case, then perhaps along with the vaccination and with the people who have already been ill, I'm very hopeful that we're going to be seeing a turnaround from this. Okay. Uh, Michael Drescher, Dr. Michael Drescher of Rabin Medical Center. Thanks for joining us once again. May we go several months before we don't have to do another conversation. That'll be looking back on this whole experience. Okay. okay. Also, thanks to Alice Greenwald, Larry Silverstein, and uh, Evan Osnos, whom we heard from earlier about 9-11. Uh, thanks to Joshua Plout, Nate Banzani, and Roni Giuliano of American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, and our technical director, Bobby Grandone. Uh, our program sponsor is the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. It's a 501c3 national charitable organization uh, representing in the United States, Israel's largest hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva in Greater Tel Aviv. Uh, the website uh, for the Friends is www.afrmc.org. Join us next month for Who is an American Jew in 2021? Insights from the Pew Study with special guests, Professor Shuli Rubin Schwartz, Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, Rabbi Elke Abramson, Abrahamson, President of the Wexner Foundation, and Professor Jonathan Sarna, a historian of American, uh, American Jewish history at Brandeis University. I'm Robert Siegel, and this has been Global Connections Navigating the New Normal. Uh, see you next month. Stay healthy and stay safe.